Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malentrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ. Chainlink is the gateway to on-chain finance for banks, asset managers, and other financial institutions. Just yesterday, SWIFT announced a collaboration with Chainlink and more than a dozen major financial institutions, including Citi, BNY Mellon, PNB Paribas, and Lloyds, as well as the largest financial market infrastructures, DTCC and Euroclear, to test how institutions can use SWIFT messages and their existing infrastructure to efficiently connect to hundreds of blockchains using one integration from Chainlink. Joining us this afternoon, we have Chainlink co-founder, Sergey Nazarov. Sergey, it is great to see you as always. Welcome back to Trade Talks. Great to see you, Jill. Thank you for having me. You got it. What is the significance of this new collaboration between Chainlink, Swift, and major capital markets players? I, I think it shows that there's a parallel world uh, that seeks to adopt blockchain technology in the global financial system very, very widely because the players involved in this are the largest financial players on the planet and the largest market infrastructures on the planet. So I think it shows that there's this parallel world where blockchain technology is continuing to be adopted very rapidly. I think the amount of value that the settlement uh, infrastructures and banks control is in the hundreds of trillions. And what that means is that even if a small portion of that value flows into the blockchain industry, then that'll bring the blockchain industry up to what I always uh, felt it was meant to be, which is not one or two trillion, but 10, 20, 30 or more trillion. And then the final thing is, um, I think that this signals that the next step in the bank's adoption of blockchains is starting to take place, where they're going beyond custodying, and they're moving on to how can they service clients' needs by moving assets across different chains, and by creating more advanced smart contracts. So all three of those things I think are pretty significant. What exactly is Chainlink CCIP and why was it chosen to help underpin the cross-chain collaboration? CCIP is the cross-chain interoperability protocol. It serves a similar role to what TCP IP does for the internet, where it connects multiple independent systems into a kind of internet of contracts. Uh, so what CCIP basically does is it allows communication between chains, whether they are private or public chains, as well as existing systems that banks use, such as SWIFT and the payment messages that SWIFT makes possible. So CCIP will enable SWIFT messages to be used to transact trillions of dollars on various blockchains, and CCIP will allow value to move across different private chains, so from one bank chain to another bank chain, expanding the market of what the, the bank chains can do with, within their own universe of banks, as well as allowing those private chains and banks to connect to public blockchains, giving them access to that market. And uh, essentially what this does is it creates an internet of contracts out of the multitude of different chains, both public and private. And that's the goal of, of CCIP, um, using the same security model that has made Chainlink able to process over $7.7 .7 trillion in transactional value so far. So the security model that we've introduced with Chainlink is now being expanded to create this internet of contracts through something like TCP IP, but for the blockchain industry. What's driving banks and other financial institutions to increasingly move on chain? Client demand. Um, banks are very driven by client demand. Client demand be began, as I mentioned multiple times, even on this great show, that they will begin with custody. Clients will come to them and say, I want to custody things. I want you to get me Bitcoin. I want you to get me some token. I want to participate in the digital asset class. Um, and that has now grown to more advanced use cases where clients not only want to purchase something from the bank, but they want the bank to get something from some other chain somewhere for them. And I think it'll progress from there onto more advanced use cases where banks will make their own smart contracts and their own on-chain fi financial products. That's the next step. And that's the step that Chainlink is already very involved in with DeFi powering you know, the majority of DeFi. So I, I think this is really driven by the users, their clients, and I think it'll continue to be driven by them as digital assets continue to become increasingly important in the banking center, sector and in the global economy. What are the key considerations for institutions that are ready to integrate blockchain technology? I think they need to think about the type of transactions that they want to engage in, so who their counterparties are. 
and then they're going to face an, a burden of integration. They're going to need to integrate with the chains and the places where their counterparties are. And that integration is what CCIP and Chainlink uh, simplify by allowing them to integrate with hundreds of chains through a single integration. So instead of them having to learn multiple chains, they can integrate Chainlink and be able to access hundreds of different chains, essentially giving them access to hundreds of different counter hundreds of different counterparties that can do different types of transactions with them. So first they need to decide what type of transactions they want to do, and then they need to integrate into the environments to do those transactions. And that second step is what, CC, what CCIP and Chainlink greatly simplifies. And by the combination of SWIFT messages as a widely accepted standard for banks to transact and to affect events, and CCIP as an increasingly accepted global standard for interacting with blockchains, that combination of SWIFT and CCIP allows an even quicker uh, ability to integrate into all those environments where they can, can transact, which is what um, this is about. Sergey, what's next for capital markets and their adoption of Web3 technology? I think um, on the early adopter side, you're going to see them making their, their own financial products on chain. You've seen some of them do, do this already. Um, in the kind of middle of the curve with the, the, the middle adopters, you're going to see them start to provide um, custody that's more advanced. So for example, the ability to purchase assets for their clients on other chains, that's what a lot of this work is driving so that they can integrate with multiple chains and they can move assets around multiple chains and they can even put those assets onto public blockchains. And then people that are lagging behind and people that haven't yet adopted blockchain technology, um, I think they'll start getting into the custody game. So I think what they'll start doing is they start providing basic custody. But, but everybody in the banking sector is going to travel the same path. They're going to provide custody to their clients. Then they're going to provide them the ability to gain access to assets in other environments, so basically other chains, for which they'll need something like CCIP to connect them to those other chains. And then they will eventually make their own financial products that they offer to clients on their chains, as will all the other banks. And then the ability to access those financial products on those other chains will be increasingly important. And then the public blockchain sphere will interact with all this as a large global marketplace that will be able to basically buy and sell some portion of the assets on private bank chains, which all of the banks that we're talking to are looking at making or are making. And so you're just going to have this proliferation of basically bank app chains that need to speak with each other and that also want access to the public blockchain market and need an efficient way to integrate, all of which this is about solving together with SWIFT in a way that um, allows them to efficiently interact with this infrastructure using their existing systems and backends. Which markets are embracing blockchain technology first and why? I think you continue to see DeFi uh, being an exciting market. Um, I think now you're seeing real world assets come into play and real world assets will really be the term that I think banks get behind because it's what they have a lot of access to and what they're very good at creating. So they're, they're very good historically of taking assets and packaging them up into a new format. And real world asset tokenization is that new format. And eventually that real world asset tokenization from banks will flow into public blockchains, making them more interesting because there'll be more varied types of collateral to back things like stable coins and, and do other exciting things. And then the final category is places that generate cash flows uniquely from blockchains, which is gaming. And I fully expect gaming to generate cash flows that eventually get packaged into some kind of on-chain real-world asset that is then made available on private bank chains and public chains. And so this, this all kind of comes full circle because you, you start to see that as you provide real-world assets and real-world cash flows into the blockchain industry, the ability to tokenize those things and move them across banks and move them into the public chains uh, becomes an increasingly attractive market for that activity which just drives more and more blockchain adoption for you know, the, the actual work of creating the cash flows. And finally, Sergey, in the last minute here, how else can Chainlink Web3 services support financial institutions? So in that journey, they're going to need to start with custody. 
Um, we can definitely help with that by giving them access to various on-chain systems efficiently so that they can sign things and approve things. Then they're going to need to move things across different chains. So for example, something will be um, given to them on bank chain A, then they'll move it to bank chain B, and then they'll wanna move it to custodian C, and that will be the more advanced uh, dynamic that they'll have to engage in. And CCIP and Chainlink as an enterprise abstraction layer will be very important for that. And then in the final stage, they'll make the types of smart contracts that you see in DeFi today, because fundamentally those are financial products and those financial products will be made by banks. And in that case, uh, Chainlink will support them in all the ways that it can by providing market data, identity data, um, various forms of automation functions, um, protecting order flows by making them immune to manipulation. So, so basically providing all the key services that allow truly decentralized, reliable, um, on-chain finance to emerge. And, and so in each stage of, of the, the bank's journey, we plan to be there providing them high quality, reliable infrastructure and enabling them to put more and more value into the public blockchain category to the degree that they're comfortable. And over time, I fully expect that the crypto markets and the global financial system will really become one thing because crypto and blockchains are the superior model. And we just need to create the technology that will allow that transition to happen in a secure and efficient way that serves the interests of everyone involved. And so, you know, that's what we're very excited to, to be doing together with, with these great banks and market infrastructures and SWIFT and, and everyone else. Because at the end of the day, I think it, it raises the entire industry up by getting more value into it and making it about more. All right, Sergey, we appreciate the insight as always. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.